Our next presenter is um, is our next presentation is Saddling Up for More Than a Paycheck by Ms. Anna Sohosky. Uh, Anna Sohosky is an equine writer who specializes in articles that focus on horses, health, and history. She specializes in art, um, she follows curiosities, obsessions, and untold stories hidden beneath the surface and strives for compelling imagery. She, faci she facilitates continuing education courses on the role of the horse on the page, introducing students to memoirs about how horses heal the physical body, the emotional spirit, and how the horse can be our mirror in creative writing on the page to spark a reader's own reflection about the horse. Ms. Sohosky. First one I will do is I will briefly consider the dire economic circumstances of Eastern Kentucky during the Great Depression and the promises of the New Deal before examining a day in the life of a Packhorse librarian and its structure and conclude with its contributions to literacy. While industrial progress took hold in Central and Western Kentucky, Residents in the eastern part of the state relied on rural and agrarian, agrarian industries, including agriculture, lumber, and grain. However, there was one dangerous and very enticing market that rose above the rest, coal mining. The reliance on coal mining on the hunt for black gold peaked in 1927, with 622 profitable and operational mines employing 64,900 69 miners and producing 69.9 tons of coal. However, labor disputes, health and safety threats, and bitter strikes haunted the industry even before the Great Depression brought the Western industrial nations to their knees. Kentucky was already ranked as one of the poorest in the United States, collapsed under the weight of both the Great Depression and closure of half the mines by 1933 both of which drove the final nails into any hope of recovery for the coal industry. Unemployment crested at 40% of working adults. The nation's economic paralysis continued to spread, and at the height of the nation's economic calamity, the governor at the time, Governor Ruby LaFoon, declared Kentucky a pauper state and begged for federal assistance. Great Depression, coupled with the collapse of the coal industry, gutted the already fragile Kentucky economy. The Great Depression stole more than a pay job and a paycheck. In some cases, families were forced to surrender farms and houses they'd owned for generations, even some dating back to the Revolutionary War, the land allocations. Men abandoned wives and children or fled the state looking for work. Babies suffered from malnutrition. Roosevelt promised a new deal to help get people back. The frustration was launched in 1935. It enjoyed early successes by putting millions of men back to work, building schools, healthcare clinics, power plants, and most importantly, roads. Many women headed households found themselves shunted into low paying sewing gardening and secretarial jobs, forcing single parent families onto relief roles. The true economic salvation for Eastern Kentucky for women would not arrive at a typewriter or in a garden or with a thimble, but on the back of a horse in between the covers of the book. Established in 1935 as well, the Pack Horse Library Project, a component of the WPA, enlisted unemployed women, uh, Appalachian women, to distribute books and magazines to residents living in a 10,000 square mile region of the state. But unemployment shared a bigger problem, another insidious problem, illiteracy. The Pack Horse Library Project also sought to broaden literacy in homes and schools. Imagine settling up your horse at 4.30 a.m., setting off to traverse rugged, remote, and muddy territory mired with sheer ravines and harrowing cliff lines. Low-lying creek beds were often the only highway system snaking through the landscape. Boots froze in stirrup irons. Horse slithered down mountain slopes. When waters flooded, librarians coaxed horses across raging rivers 
that are deep enough to reach an animal's belly. Pack horse librarians were required to deliver their literary loads year round in any weather. If the destination was too remote to reach on horseback or the equine became lame, came up lame, riders walked. One librarian hiked 18 miles after a mule died on the route. Rocky or steep conditions required riders to dismount and lead their horses, as I said. Predicting muddy or snowy conditions depended on the librarian's instincts. You didn't want to be stranded from the base, a miles away from a ba library base in a snowstorm or rainstorm. These posed life-threatening conditions. This was GPS, it became GPS on horseback. The directions to family houses were not given like we would normally see on a slip of paper but were scribbled on bits of paper with, with verbal instructions, with references to topographical, to topographical signposts, often served as the only maps. So you know in your own lives, um, when somebody is trying to describe a location to you, they say, oh, well, just go, go down to the place where the gas station is, and it's, um, it's the Blue Moon gas station, and take a left there. It was the same sort of theory. Geographical areas were nicknamed though, nicknamed though for their danger, including Hell for Sin Sartini, Troublesome in Cut Shin Creeks, and suggested landscapes were precarious in nature and made the jobs that way themselves. The first Pack Horse Library site was established in Leslie County, followed by nearby Harlan, Clay, Whitley, Jackson, Owsley, and Lee counties. In this map, you can see the, um, on the left the counties that have pack horse librarian sites underlined in red, and then on the right, they're highlighted in red as well. Within two years, by 1937, two years into the groundbreaking project, 30 counties had established a pack horse library. But they were not your normal library, your regular library that you're associated with. They were housed in churches, post offices, sheds, and general stores, provided the librarians the necessary space to operate each program. Each site was staffed by five or six carriers or riders, and one on-site librarian was responsible for processing donations, reconditioning materials, and devising carrier routes. This is a photo of one of them in Hidden County, in Hidden County, Kentucky. After picking up their load for a week at the county's headquarters, each carrier was assigned a portion of the specific county. They rode three to four circuits, what they call circus, circuits, logging an average of 100 to 120 miles each week. Local school districts, county boards of education, civic clubs, community organizations, and particularly the Kentucky PTA shouldered the operational costs and overhead. Even in the face of challenging geography, meager operating funds, and dependence on donated materials, often in poor condition, the Pack Horse Library offered the mental respite to isolated mountain communities. In this photo, you can see Pack Horse Librarians <coughs> in their actual local library site packing up their saddlebags, selecting books, and packing up the saddlebags. This is how women during the Great Depression in, um, in uh, Kentucky, Eastern Kentucky, um, managed to get a paycheck. The WPA, unfortunately, <coughs> excuse me, only paid the salaries of the carriers and librarians. So as I mentioned before, the things like operational costs were so shouldered by other entities. Each pack horse librarian earned $28 a month, which is approximately $495 a day today in today's costs. Riders paid the costs for the animals' board and food and boarding. Riders without equine transport leased a horse or a mule from local farmers, but were still responsible for their care and upkeep. Riders packed saddlebags, pillowcases, and potato sacks with upwards of 100 books and magazines to deliver. 
the average librarian was between 25 and 35, married, but the sole wage earner. The motivation for these 1930s writers surpassed more than a modest paycheck. Hackers librarians picked their way across dangerous terrain to spread the gift of literacy. 63% of Kentucky residents at that time did not have access to a public library. Mountain schools rarely had libraries, meaning that many students living in rural areas had never checked out a book. A visit from a Packhorse librarian unlocked the features of families in a way that production never could. Over time, these women became part of the families that they visited, and their success bred more literacy. <coughs> WA policies required that each librarian be local to the community. The reason for that was because there were deep-rooted suspicions of outsiders. The Kentuckians, especially in Eastern Kentucky, were very independent-minded, very self-sufficient, did not trust things that they did not know. Local writers understood the cultural and social norms that formed a way of life, both of which gave them a leg up for success. The librarians recognized the depth of religious belief in communities and offered to read Bible passages allowed to gain a patron's trust. Bible teachings were normally handed down orally or received in churches, but came alive when a carrier read passages of scripture and cramped Appalachian, Appalachian living rooms. A visit from a bookwoman also offered comfort to the infirm, whether from injury or age. In this photo, a pack horse librarian um, reads, and you can see the stack of books, and he's got his hand uh, with an open book um, in it, uh, read to him a selection from a magazine. This man had been permanently injured by a bullet wound and listened to um, one of the PA, WPA's bookwomen read aloud. An unintentional in addition to comforting the infirm, librarians read to their patrons or taught family members to read. An unintentional benefit of this traveling library was its evolution into an effective and necessary communications mechanism across the miles. Writers brought news from distant family members, and in some cases fetched a doctor or a midwife in cases of medical distress. Reports of births and deaths to isolated mountain families found a conduit in, in the riders. Carriers often delivered medicine. Young pregnant women received information about hygiene and infant care because of regular visits by a WPA pack horse librarian. These women became part of a family as the popularity for the project grew. This particular woman in Packers Librarian picture is a pregnant woman who's a young woman who had no access to medical care. So this Packers Librarian took it upon herself to discover magazines and books that discuss basic hygiene and cares of ba young babies. And so she delivered them at, um, often. Paper covered walls um, paled in comparison to the gift of literacy for families who lived in shacks the size of closets. In this photo, you'll notice, and in many of the other photos, you'll notice that the walls are papered with um, newspapers. Bring me a book to read was the cry of children upon the arrival of the traveling librarian to a mountain school. Hordes of children swarmed the Packhorse Library, eager for her to unload her literary cargo. Picture books ignited an interest in reading. Once students learned how to read, children read to their parents and grandparents. Books by Mark Twain and the classic Robinson Crusoe were the early favorites. But as children grew, so did their interests in the outside world. Travel and adventure titles flew out of the saddlebags into inquisitive hands. Fantasies fairy tales and stories transported them to distant lands and fed their hug for a story and reading. The reading bug bit the mothers and fathers too. 
Parents squeezed for time preferred magazines. Women's Home Companion kept female readers in touch with recipes and fashions. And gentle stories like Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm allowed from a respite from, uh, from daily obligations. Popular mechanics guided do-it-yourselfers to repair farm implements or sewing machines. National Geographic and Western Story magazine fed a growing curiosity in the world beyond the mountains. Newspaper coverage ignited donations of reading materials and kept communities best abreast of the WAA Packhorse Library. As you can see in this clip, um, the government buys no books. For the Kentucky Packhorse Library, it draws on the government only for carriers. It does not buy books or rent library buildings. Clubs and other local organizations have supplied centers for the libraries. Books and magazines have, become, have come in bundles from half the states in the Union. Recently, a Californian born in Lawrence County sent the Pack Horse Library there a selection of 500 books as a memorial to his mother. Library staff managed book donation drives and solicited parent-teacher associations, scouting troops, Sunday, or su Sunday school classes, and women's civic organizations to solicit read reading materials or funds to build the collections. Creative campaigns sprouted around the country. As word of need spread throughout the country, book donations from nearly half the states arrived. One particularly successful campaign called the Penny Fund Plan encouraged all PTA members to give a penny towards purchasing book materials. The old saying, one person's trash is another person's treasure, was part of what also defined the, the library campaigns. When the demand eclipsed inventory, librarians made scrapbooks from damaged materials, collecting recipes, newspaper clippings, sewing patterns, and canning and gardening tips to distribute in place of a book. Carriers themselves gathered weekly to sift through discarded trash that formed the basis of these scrapbooks. Pictures and articles, recipes and poems transformed tattered books and magazines into pictures, picture books for children and adults alike. Scrapbooks spawned creativity and communication in patrons as well. Many women passed on their favorite recipes and quilting patterns to the carriers to be glued and bound in another handmade book to share. Jason Vance of Middle Tennessee State University's James E. Walker Library traveled to the FDR Presidential Library in Hyde Park, New York, to read and photograph the collected books. In his 2012 article in Library and Information History, scrapbooks fell into 11 theme categories, recipes, mountain ballads, pictures, postcards, bio biographical sketches of famous people, local histories, Kentucky history, quilt patterns, odd place names, local flora, flora, and collections of articles on a given subject. Fans wrote that 2,653 scrapbooks were cir circulated among Pack Horse Librarian patrons. The Great Depression lit the conversation for re use and recycling, reuse and recycling long. Ingenuity did not stop at scrapbooks. With little or no resources for administrative tasks, cheese boxes found a new purpose as card files. Prune boxes served as sorting boxes, boxes for donations. License plates bent into a 90 degree angle, dressed up as bookends for the site's library collection. A simple broom handle assured that newspaper do donations were preserved until transported by a carrier. Though considered highly successful, the Pack Horse Library project ended in 1943 when President Roosevelt severed funding for the program. Demand, demand for workers to fuel military efforts of World War II but put the previously unemployed wor back, workers back to working full time. 
The legacy of the Pack Horse Library was evident. Nearly 1,000 literary equestrians served 1.5 million residents in 48 counties, cementing the Pack Horse Librarian's history, place in history. The project fostered true economic hope in the midst of the Great Depression, but per perhaps more importantly, the program gave birth to a mind's flight from all, on the, from all from the back of the horse. Photos in this presentation, unless otherwise noted, are from the Goodman Paxton Photographic Collection, Special Collections at the University of Kentucky Libraries, which have a very large collection of Pack Horse Librarian photographs. I've listed a few references from, for the, pro, the pro, um, presentation and those in my contact. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Hosky. Um, our final presentation.